Um, I just want to say uh, what an honor it is for Holly and I and our team to have the two of you uh, be planted into this place in this season. It, it, there's, a, there's, there's a few of you in here where there's, there's some, there, there might be a little bit of a gap of some age. <laughs> and there are moments where I think to myself, um, like, wh- why and how are they st- staying here? When it feels like at times for me that uh, there's a, there's just a there's me, there's better places maybe that you would want to be that have things a little bit more experienced when it comes to the the teaching and preaching of God's word when it comes to it. but all all that all that to say for for the two of you and and those that are in a similar season to be able to come in on this place and have you be like no this is our church mm-hmm. and, and like you're our, you're our pastor and we're a part of this thing with you, has been an amazing encouragement and impact in, in Holly and I's life and our family. So we honor you. We're thankful that you're a part and going to bring the word today. And uh, we just really love and, and care about both of you. So with that, uh, will you just help me welcome and thank Diane for being here? Good morning, church. Wow, you look good from this angle. I mean, you look good from any angle, but <laughs> it's really nice to see faces. And um, for the online community, we're delighted to have you. Um, nice jammies, by the way. <laughs> you know, as I, was, as I was sitting there this morning, I bought this, I don't know, maybe a year or so ago. And as I was looking at it sitting next to me, I thought, hmm, that's got rainbows on it. And you know what rainbows remind me of? A loving, saving God who does not want to judge us, but wants to save us. So, anyway, um, it's a delight to be up here, actually. Um, The phrase I want to talk about this morning from Proverbs is... A favorite, (laughs) the fear of the Lord. My title is The Fear of the Lord, How Afraid Should I Be? So it's when, in all of the wisdom and poetic books of the Old Testament, we have that phrase, the fear of the Lord. Um, Job, uh, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. Those are the wisdom and poetic books. And so... Each one of them has that phrase, so we know it's got to be important for some reason if it's repeated like this. And so the book of Proverbs, however, can be really challenging to read sometimes. It seems quite random. So, um, in fact, (laughs) there are two verses right next to each other. One of them says, answer a fool according to his folly. And the other one says, don't answer a fool according to his folly. Well, that's helpful. (laughs) So, if Proverbs, and I do believe this, was written by Solomon to his son to prepare him for life, all I can say is, uh, not helpful, Dad. However, if you read the first nine chapters, you'll notice that there seems to be a kind of a continuity there. And it's clearly a discourse from a father to his son, preparing to send him out into the world. How do you face the world out there with wisdom? But then you get to chapter 10, and it's like, pow, pow, pow. All of these proverbs are just hitting you. Life is coming at you randomly from all directions. What do you do with it? And yeah, there are some verses that have related topics, but by and large, it's a hodgepodge of advice uh, on any number of topics. And in fact, sometimes, like I just quoted, it almost seems to be contradictory. So what do we do with it? Well, let's look at it this way. Proverbs 1 through 9 provides the guiding principles, and then chapter 10 begins the chaos of life situations where you get to take those principles and apply them because 
How many of you know life is not organized? I don't care how much control you like. <laughs> it comes at us, just out of the dark, around a corner. Things shock us with uh, the unexpected. And that's what those first nine chapters help us with. So is there a code of some kind that can help us make sense of what's going on? I'm so glad you asked that, because in fact there is. And we're going to look at that by reading Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. In case you're wondering, I'm reading this out of the NLT. Um, I don't even know what that stands for. New something translation. So <laughs> if it doesn't look familiar to you. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline. I kind of wish I'd outlined that in bold and red and neon wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning in these proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And we know these are wisdom books, but did you notice how many times the word discipline is in just these first few verses? Well, we'll get to that. All right, so fear of the Lord. What is cool about wisdom in the Bible is that it has a very broad definition. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, I got none. And I'm not even sure that Proverbs is going to help me get it. But the thing that's beautiful about God and about the Bible and about his plan for us is that wisdom has such a broad definition in the Bible. It revolves around three primary issues that will kind of help us understand it. First is practical knowledge. These would be things like uh, botany, zoology, music, law, diplomacy, flora, fauna, literature, other elements whole bunch of topics in there in regard to, and then the second area is decision-making. So in regard to decision-making, Solomon's request for wisdom is connected to his ability to judge, to rule the people, to make wise decisions for their benefit, for helping them. And then the third aspect of wisdom is in building the temple. And that's a whole other topic Beautiful topic, in fact, but one little key I'm going to mention, the New Testament reveals to us who is the real temple, right? Who is the real temple? Jesus, but what has he made us to be? His temple. Anybody here trying to build God's temple? <laughs> yeah, takes wisdom, doesn't it? All right, so. We're going to look at this as a code for how we understand wisdom, and particularly in the book of Proverbs. First of all, we have the goal. In verse number three, verse number three again says, their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. I'm going to skip to another reading, and we'll get back to chapter 1. But chapter 2 reiterates some of that stuff, and I think it's worth looking at. So let's look at chapter, chapter 2, verse 1 through 
verses 1 through 11. I hope you like reading the Bible, people, because this is where wisdom is. It ain't here. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask, can you see me? Am I bright enough for you? Anybody know my son, Jason? This might be a clue. <laughs> I was in a store a couple of days ago. I was ready, wearing red, and, and a lady whom I've never met before said, oh, you look so good in red. You should wear it all the time, which was kind of nice to hear. And my response was, well, I figure it's only fair to give people warning. All right, chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight. Ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord and you will gain knowledge of God. For the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. Anyone need common sense? Short supply nowadays. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the paths of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. Then you will understand what is right just and fair, and you will find the right way to go. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will fill you with joy. Wise choices will watch over you. Understanding will keep you safe. So these beautiful verses, verse 3 of chapter 1, what is right, just, and fair. This is the goal. This is what wisdom is meant to do. But you know, I, I think it's kind of important for us to also realize who this is being written to. I might say this a couple times this morning. While the Bible is written for us, it is not written to us. Did you get that? The Bible is written for us, but it's written thousands of years ago, and especially Proverbs. So we have to have at least a rudimentary understanding of the people whom it was written to because they're the ones that are really going to understand it. We like to take our century, our culture, our language, our experience and superimpose it on the Bible and say that's what it means. But we've got to go to the people who heard it first because that's who it was addressed to. And then out of the understanding of how they would have perceived it, we can get a depth of meaning that will be much closer to God's intent and will bring great blessing. So who is this young man who is receiving these lessons? He's already a member of the community of God's people. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. He's already a son. He's already chosen. He doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to do what's right, just, and fair to become a son. He already is one. That's his birthright. In our New Testament understanding, we would say, this guy is saved. What, it, what he is doing now is learning how to live as a son, a member of God's chosen community. So that's, that's the goal. I'm not going to go into that more than that. We'll see it as we go along. The goal is for us to learn how to live and do what is right, what is just, and what is fair, both towards God and towards each other. The second one point is the means. What are the means for achieving this? doing what is right, just, and fair. That's not an easy thing to do. It can roll off the tongue, but oh my goodness, facing the situations that come in chapter 10 and the rest of the book. All right, so 
In this book particularly, but you'll find this all the way through scripture, you have a contrast between the two ways. You've got the way of wisdom. You've got the way of foolishness. And it's illustrated. Now, remember who this is being written to. I have a grandson that just graduated from high school. He's gone out into the world. I put him in this place. What's going to make the biggest impression on him? The ladies. So what does Solomon do? He paints a picture of two women. And what's interesting is that the, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew originally, but then about 150 B.C., I'm not real good on all my dates, um, they translated it into the Greek because that became the language of education of the world, of the lingua franca. And so they translated it into Greek. So the word for wisdom in Hebrew, and this is about the only Hebrew I know, is chokmah, and the word in Greek is Sophia. It's a little easier to think of Sophia as being a beautiful lady because that's a beautiful name. So here we've got this contrast of the way of wisdom, the way of folly or foolishness, and it's illustrated by two women. You know, the thing of it is, uh, what's tricky is that there seems to be a lot of similarities. If you read through the first nine chapters, there's a lot of similarities between these two women. I mean, on the surface, it could be a little confusing. Sophia, or Lady Wisdom, is attractive. The immoral woman is seductive. Sophia cries out in the streets, the marketplace, the entrance of the city gates. The immoral woman lingers on street corners. Sophia promises to pour out her spirit, to make her words known. She's better than gold, more precious than jewels. She bestows long life, riches, and honor. Her ways are pleasant, and her paths are peace. She is a tree of life, and holding fast to her brings blessings. Don't you want to know this lady? Yeah. yeah. The immoral woman, her house is the road to the grave, dooming everyone who enters. Her mouth is smoother than oil, but in the end, she is as bitter as poison. She cares nothing about the path of life. If you read chapter 8 of Proverbs, this whole chapter gives this beautiful picture of Sophia. All of her attributes, all of her power, all of her presence with God Almighty. And you can sum that up in verse 35. Whoever finds me finds life and receives favor from the Lord. So, we have the way of wisdom and the way of foolishness. Chapter 9 presents both ladies, well, one lady, one woman. And the thing of it is, you get to the end of the chapter and it's like, what comes next? It's end of season and they gave me a cliffhanger. We don't know which path, which way the young man is going to choose. It just stops. And then chapter 10 begins with a pow, pow, pow. So, how do we approach the two ways? How do we learn to do what is right, just, and fair? Well, we come to the third and probably the most, well, I won't say the most important. That's always risky when you're talking about the Bible. Just saying. However, for our topic today, it's the main one I want to focus on, and that is the fear of the Lord. That's the foundation for all of it. How to do what is right, just, fair, how to consistently choose the way of wisdom, the fear of the Lord. 
So let me ask you this, what are you afraid of? You think that over while I get a drink out of the rainbow. Thank you, Jesus. And don't say nothing because there's also a fear, name of fear for that. Ha! Ah. All right, so I'm not going to try to pronounce all of these because it's just not worth it to me. One that I can, arrhythmophobia, arrhythmophobia. See, I can't even pronounce that one. That's the easiest. This is the fear of numbers. I have a shudder of memory from every story problem every teacher ever tried to tell me. Still lingers. Then there's another one called fear of the color yellow, which I don't know why you'd be afraid of yellow sunshine, daisies. However, I'm from Alaska, and it's justifiable in Alaska when mom says, don't eat the yellow snow. There's another one, maybe you need to know the name of this one, it's a little bit easier, it's called nomophobia. And it's the fear of being without your mobile phone. <laughs> and you know who you are. My personal favorite, which I'm absolutely in no danger of having, the fear that is, unless sometime in the future I have to get dentures and then that would be another issue. This is the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. All right, phobias by definition are irrational. But there's a whole lot of other fears that are based on reality and personal experience. I have a fear of flying. Oh, dear Jesus. We went to an Indian village in Alaska after Bible college. And I'm not going to have time to tell that story. So you're just going to have to wait for it another time. But flying is definitely my fear. I mean, what kind of sense of humor does God have to call me to be a missionary who has spent my entire life on planes from the one-seater with cloth walls and windows to the 747. Yeah, okay. But what do we do with that pesky phrase, the fear of the Lord? Plenty of people are already afraid of God. Maybe, uh, maybe you're afraid that we're in some kind of cosmic game of whack-a-mole. You know whack-a-mole? Yeah, some of you do. You love it too much, too, I can tell. So it's this game where these little moles pop up, and you have like a club, and when they, it's mechanical, when they pop up, you have to hit them in the head. Charming, right? But how many people have that impression of God? That that's the kind of God that he is. Step out of line. Do one thing a little bit wrong, and whack. You're done for. So when we talk about fear of the Lord, we're, we're afraid. That's what seems to come out, especially if you've had scary fathers or father figures. Then that can also be a defense mechanism that, of fear. And because God is called father, oh, I struggled with this one for years. Because God is called father, it's really hard to understand how he could be a God of love and mercy and kindness and generosity and compassion or safe. Well, what is the fear of the Lord? The first thing we have to understand is that this is actually what is called a bound phrase. It means you should put hyphens between each word. You can't separate them to define it because they're bound together. The concepts are bound together. And I was going to have us read from Exodus chapter 3, but I think it's a passage we all know pretty well. And it's where God comes to Moses and says, you're going to be a deliverer, a liberator. 
And Moses has a ton of excuses. And finally he says, yeah, but when they ask who has sent me, what do I tell them? And God gives this wonderfully helpful answer. I am that I am. What? Yeah, I get that. Well, I've been listening to this wonderful podcast by a Jewish pastor. Yeah, he's both named Marty Solomon, and he says that if you look at that word, that term, that we translate as I am that I am, it can actually be translated, I am here. God calls to Moses, Moses answers, here I am. God gives his name, and it is I am here. Last part of that introduction, God says, I have been watching closely. And in verse 7, I'm sorry, we're not reading this, but you can jot it down. Exodus 3, verse 7. God says, I have seen, I have heard, I am aware, and I have come down. I am here. This is God's name. In chapter 3, Moses is afraid. He falls on his face. He is truly afraid. In chapter 33, Moses sees God face to face as a man sees his friend. Moses' face glows with the glory of God, having come face to face with him. And the people are afraid when they see his face because now he is a friend of God and he has no fear. There are 365 verses in the Bible about do not fear, don't be afraid. So what kind of fear is it then that we're supposed to have if we have advice for every day of the year not to be afraid? Okay, let's look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 20. Okay, thank you. I know I normally like to have you but I don't need that today. Okay, this gives time for all of you good people that have tree books. We had a pastor call it that. You've got e-books, you've got tree books. I think it's pretty clever. Okay, Exodus chapter 20, verse 20 gives us a clue. Don't be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come in this way to test you and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. See, a lot of times we don't get this picture that God actually spoke to the entire congregation of Israel when he gave the Ten Commandments the first time around. He comes down on the mountain with thunder and lightning and fierceness and earthquake and trumpet blast, and they're terrified. And they say, Moses, you go up to the mountain and talk to God. He's too scary for us. And Moses says, don't, don't have that kind of fear because what he is wanting is to test you so that, in fact, your fear of him will keep you from sinning. So, you know, after he bring, he, 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 um, God gives the Ten Commandments, and, and he plans for Moses to go back up on the mountain, and he does, and he's in the process of receiving this glorious covenant from God for these people to be a husband to them, a provider for them, a protector for them, all these beautiful things. And what are the people doing down in the valley? Ten commandments on stone up here, breaking probably every one of them down there. 
So they had said to Moses, before he went up the mountain, they said, all that God has told us we will do. Really? Really? So, oh my goodness, Moses is desperate. He says, God, show me your glory. I just cannot do this. So once again, God invites him to come up to the mountain, hides him in a cleft of the rock, shows him part of his glory, and at this moment, when Moses had gone up to the mountain the first time, and the people have turned to vile, disgusting, horrible sin and debauchery, and now Moses on the mountain a second time wants to see God's glory, and God says, I'm going to tell you my name. Well, huh. okay, so what is this name? that he's going to tell us. What name would you expect after everything that they had done? Scary. You want scary? You want fear of the Lord? Let's read Exodus chapter 34, some of my favorite verses in the Bible. Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 7. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him, and he called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. So that first part, wow, that was great, right? Yay, hallelujah, amen, clap our hands. And then all of a sudden we come to verse 7, and everybody gets hung up there. But again, who's the Bible written to? Not us. The Bible is written for us, but to the people who were there at that time. And these are the Israelites who have been freed out of slavery, out of bondage, brought into a new relationship with Almighty God, creator of the universe. And what happens from the get-go? They're complaining and they're whining and they're dragging their feet. And man, at one point Moses goes, I can't do this, God. Find somebody else. Ever feel that way? Ever have somebody else feel that way about you? So, here's the parents. It's not just them on this journey. Remember, they, they rebelled so bad against God that they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. It's not just the parents that are wandering. It's their children. It's their grandchildren. It's probably great-grandchildren who have done nothing to rebel against God but are stuck trudging through the wilderness to the third and fourth generation. And we totally overlook God's promise to bless us to a thousand generations. Oh, people, we got to change what we think God is, who he is, and what his personality and what his actions are in our lives. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, who forgives iniquity, rebellion, and sin. I'm out of time. <laughs> I want to bring this down really close to us because this is where we live. 
I'd love to tell you about what Yahweh means. I'd love to go into the whole reason. Let me just tell you this. When you're reading your Bible, especially in the Old Testament, and you see the word Lord, there's two ways you will see it. One is just with a capital L, small O-R-D. The other way is with all caps, probably a big L, but then a small capital O-R-D. Whenever you read the all caps, you can substitute the personal name Yahweh, which means I am here. Oh, please, plant that in your heart. Every time you read that, I am here. Okay, so then we get to Jesus in the New Testament. And what does he say? Oh, it was shocking for the people in that time frame. They know I am as this one and no other gods. And Jesus says, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the way. You want to get wisdom? Get Jesus. Get Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.30, and I'm going to wrap this up, I promise. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 30. God has united you with Christ Jesus for our benefit. God made him, Jesus, to be wisdom itself. Christ, let's go back out over that again. God has united you with Christ Jesus. You're one. If you have accepted him and trusted in him, trusted in him, it's not because you are always doing what is right and just and fair. Because nobody can do that. We're in process of trying to get better at it. We're trying to follow the way of wisdom more often, but sometimes we just go off the path. And it can be deadly and it can be hurtful. But even if you are staying on the path, people, listen to me, you will still experience some disciplining from the Lord. And that means maybe a straight path, but lots of this. Because he's strengthening those spiritual muscles in you that are only going to come from having some difficulties in the way. And we think, oh, man, I can't do anything right. Look how God is punishing me. What if he's not? What if he's giving you spiritual muscles for that next higher hill and the next one and then the mountain? God has united you with Christ Jesus for our benefit. Didn't do anything for God to do this. Didn't do anything for Jesus. What do they get out of it? They get us. <laughs> When Jesus talks about the joy set before him that took him to the cross, you know who the joy was? It was you. You are that joy. He saw you from here. Oh, he saw you before I ever got there. He said, I'm going there because I want them here. Yahweh, I am here. There's several other great verses in Colossians. I wanted to tie back with our wonderful series on the book of Colossians. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Remember what we read about Sophia? In him, all the wisdom that he gives. If he's the treasurer, he is also the giver. 
He doesn't just hold it to himself. He wants to lavish. Remember Sophia? She lavishes gifts on people. Jesus is the wisdom of God. Jesus is the Sophia of God. You need wisdom? <laughs> Get Jesus. Get Jesus. I got to stop there. I just want to ask you, where are you today? Do you need to have a real healing of your definition of God as Father? I'm a miracle. I'm a miracle. I had two bad fathers. And I am a miracle because I am living free. And because I know who my Papa really is. And if you need help with that, man, I would love to be there to help you. And maybe we need a class. Who knows? Because <laughs> I think a lot of people struggle with this idea. But if you really want to know who Papa is, get Jesus. He is the, the Bible says, the exact representation of God. Jesus says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. The fear of the Lord has nothing to do with the fear of being afraid. It has to do with, oh, man, I love this man. Sorry, Mike. I love this man down here. And it would break my heart to think that I've done something that hurts him. And that's built on relationship. And so my fear is that I disappoint him or that I hurt him or I do something to make him feel less valuable or whatever it might be. And that's healthy in a relationship. It's not all about what I can get out of it, what blesses me, but it's about that love for the other, that fear of Yahweh. That's the word. Fear of Yahweh is, oh God, give me wisdom to choose the right way because I don't want to disappoint you. I don't want to break your heart. I don't want you to ever feel disappointed, discouraged with me. Not that he ever will. That's our feelings that we put on him. The fear, the true fear of the Lord is that delightful, intimate, close relationship with Papa that you can crawl up into his lap and know that you are safe. I had a Jason story. That'll have to wait for another time. It's too long. But I had a cousin born late in life to my aunt and uncle child number five, and the oldest was 19, a blessing I don't need. And Becky was a little scamp. She was adorable, and she loved her daddy, but she was a scamp. And one day, daddy had to apply the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge. <laughs> and afterwards, tears streaming down her face as she reaches up to daddy. And he pulls her onto his lap and he says, Becky, do you know why I had to spank you? And she says, yes, Daddy. It's because you don't want me to go to hell. <laughs> you have a loving Papa who wants you to have that kind of fear of him that keeps you from sinning. And it's not because he gets any benefit out of it, but it's because he wants to lavish you with his gifts. Let's pray. Oh, Papa, beautiful, beautiful Papa, thank you that we can come to you in the name of Jesus. 
Yahweh, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in Jesus. I pray for everyone here, Lord, who has, we all have fears of one sort or another, but I pray they'll have the healthy, life-giving fear of the Lord. I pray this for me, that I won't be doing foolish things. We make enough mistakes just because we're human and we're living in a fallen world, but I don't have to choose to do them if I choose Jesus. Thank you that you have made, oh, you haven't made a way. <laughs> you are the way. And you are here.